Now that we've examined most of the general components of a simple payload, let's look at the core, the Arduino. What is the Arduino itself? The Arduino Uno is a type of microcontroller which is a type of computer. Microcontrollers are similar to a laptop or desktop computer except that they don't run full operating systems capable of hosting multiple programs at once. Instead, they run only one program at a time. Arduino Uno is the flagship controller from the Arduino company that produces it. There are many other Arduino brand microcontroller options as well as options from other companies. Microcontrollers are often meant to control external systems like reading sensors, controlling motors, interacting with other digital devices, while consuming as little space and electrical power as possible. Many microcontrollers like the Arduino Uno have relatively low computing power and are not the fastest at making complex computations like operating on decimal point numbers. The Arduino Uno runs programs written in C++ with additional bits created by the Arduino company to make many common tasks easier and simpler. Microcontrollers have a bigger cousin called microprocessors that more closely resemble a desktop or laptop computer. A popular option for a microprocessor is the Raspberry Pi Single Board Computer, or SBC. SBCs like the Raspberry Pi run full operating systems and can run multiple programs at once, though they usually don't have nearly as strong of specs as a desktop or laptop computer. SBCs are great for crunching numbers for complex math and doing complex networking and device interfacing like Wi-Fi or the use of a VGA monitor. Because a Raspberry Pi runs a Linux-based operating system, it can run programs written in many languages, but one very common language used is Python. Microcontrollers and microprocessors are different from each other and can be very different from other devices of the same type. So what sets them apart? A common question people might ask themselves when designing an electronic project is what kind of computer is best for their purposes. Let's compare the basic stats of an Arduino Uno and the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B+. Here's a chart showing some basic stats comparing the two devices. The Arduino's logic level voltage is 5 volts, which means that if you do something like blink an LED, it's going to do that with 5 volts. The Raspberry Pi's is 3.3 volts. The Arduino itself can be powered with a 7 to 12 volts, 20 milliamp power supply, assuming we're using the Arduino's onboard regulator. The Raspberry Pi, on the other hand, requires specifically a 5 volt supply that can provide at least 2.5 amps of current. And this is just for the board itself. So we can see here that the power consumption for just the core is vastly different for these two models. The Arduino Uno has 14 general input-output pins, and the Raspberry Pi has 40. The maximum current that each pin can provide on the Arduino is only 20 milliamps, where on the Raspberry Pi, I wasn't able to find a definitive number in my research. Some details like this might be difficult to find for Raspberry Pi models because a single board computer like this is so much more complex of a device than a simple microcontroller. The core processor for the Arduino Uno is an Atmega 328P, and for the Raspberry Pis, the Broadcom BCM 2837B0. The Uno has an 8-bit core, and the Raspberry Pi has a 64-bit quad-core. Uno is running at 16 megahertz, and Pi is running at 1.4 gigahertz. Just from those two bits of information alone, we can see that the Raspberry Pi is much more fit to perform complex calculations than the Uno. It has a wider bit width and four cores, so it can handle larger numbers and can perform multiple calculations simultaneously. And because the frequency is so high, it can calculate more times per second than the Uno. The Uno has 32 kilobytes of program space and 1 kilobyte of EEPROM, which is onboard flash memory. The Raspberry Pi doesn't have its own storage, instead you install an operating system on an SD card and load that into the Raspberry Pi. Uno has 2 kilobytes of RAM compared to the Pi's 1 gigabyte. The Uno is slightly smaller in size than the Pi, but it's half the mass. And if you buy these, the Uno is going to cost around $22, and the Pi is going to cost around $35. From this, we can see that the Uno is more meant for cheap, low power, and somewhat simpler solutions. Although, depending on the programmer, the Uno can achieve some surprising tasks. The Pi is more meant for very fast and complex operations like video or other things that require a full operating system to run. The 8-bit core of the Arduino is more fit for basic integer math like counting up and counting down or adding and subtracting integers. The Uno is capable of dealing with decimal point numbers, otherwise known as floating point numbers, but because floating point numbers and their operations are complex in binary, performing these operations using only 8 bits takes extra clock cycles and is inefficient. 
On the other hand, 32-bit microcontrollers are more fit for these types of math operations, and multi-core 64-bit SBCs, like the Raspberry Pi, handle those kinds of computations extremely easily. Because of this, microprocessors like the Raspberry Pi are more fit for computation-intensive tasks like, for example, live video processing or complex live data analysis. On the other hand, controllers usually have more internal components for handling low-level device-to-device communication and control. Let's look at another chart to compare the extra features present in both devices to compare what context they're most fit for. The Arduino Uno has a dedicated analog-to-digital converter, PWM driver, external interrupt pin and handler, built-in SPI communication interface, UART interface, and I2C interface. It has low power and power down settings, capacitive touch capability, and built-in EEPROM for long-term data storage. The Raspberry Pi has a 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 4.2 BLE, Gigabit Internet over USB 2.0, HDMI out, 4 USB 2 ports, a CSI camera port, a DSI display port for touchscreens, 4 poles stereo out and composite out, and a built-in micro SD card port for storing the operating system. While both devices are capable of doing a lot of similar tasks just fine, we can see they're optimized for different things. Raspberry Pi is more fit for higher level tasks comparable to a full desktop computer, as seen by the fact that it has an HDMI port for a monitor, port for a camera, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and USB ports. If, for example, your goal is to design something like a machine that uses a camera to solve a Rubik's Cube using an object or color detection, a Raspberry Pi would be great for this and any other situation that would use camera data manipulation since there's so much data involved. However, maybe you want to design something that's battery powered and optimized for extremely low power or extremely small size, or meant to directly manage many sensors. Then the Arduino is the way to go. Additionally, the Arduino is a simpler type of computer than the Raspberry Pi, which means that a designer can embed an Arduino into a larger design, and many companies actually sell their own off-brand Arduinos. Whereas, there's no easy way for a designer to completely replicate a Raspberry Pi. Two very different devices optimized to solve different problems. Analyze your task at hand, and choose your weapon wisely. SBCs come in a variety of options. Raspberry Pi brand comes in smaller and cheaper footprints with the Raspberry Pi Zero, which costs $5, and other brands like BeagleBoard are available. Similarly, Arduino has a family of products with different capabilities like the Arduino Due, which uses a 32-bit core, with more communication protocols available. Even more so, microcontrollers come in a variety of available products like PIC and Teensy that offer different computing and communication capabilities. Uno Subsystems now that we've seen some of the computing solutions that could be used for designing a payload, let's dive deeper under the hood of the controller that we've used for our example payload, the Arduino Uno. The Arduino Uno is a 5-volt, 8-bit microcontroller. When power is connected to it, it runs the last program that was uploaded. These programs are written in the C++ programming language, with some extra bells and whistles added by the Arduino company to make many operations easier. Earlier in our lessons, we've looked at some of the capabilities the Arduino Uno has and how some of the program functions work. Generally speaking, these programs have a setup function that runs once at power up and a loop function that repeatedly runs until power is lost or until the reset button is pressed. If reset is pressed, this stops the system and starts back from the beginning at the setup function. These functions use curly brackets to define the contents of the function and parentheses to state the inputs of the function. Note that our setup and loop functions don't have anything in their parentheses. This is because these particular functions don't normally have inputs, but the programmer is able to define their own custom functions that can have inputs and output values. Setup and loop functions can be thought of as outside functions, so there isn't any way to pass a value through these functions at startup. Within these functions, each statement is completed with a semicolon, and statements are evaluated from top to bottom. When a program is written and the Run or Upload button is pressed in the Arduino Development Environment, or IDE, the IDE checks the code to make sure that everything is written following the rules of the C++ language, like semicolons at the end of every statement. After that, the code is then converted into binary for uploading to the Arduino itself. From this point, the Arduino runs that binary code to execute any actions. A programmer can add notes to explain parts of the code using comments, in C++, a comment can be made with a pair of slashes or anything between a pair of slash stars, like this comment. Let's look at the specialized components of the Arduino and related functions. Digital. Uno is a programmable digital electronic computer. 
By this I mean it uses electricity to power its computation mechanism as opposed to computers using physical mechanics to carry out an operation. While there's a world of electronics that purely deals in continuous signals that respond to any variation, a digital device responds to two discrete voltage levels, a digital high level and a digital low level. The UNO is a 5 volt logic level digital device, so it encodes a binary 1 or high or true as a 5 volt on a pin, and it associates a binary 0 or low or false with 0 volts. Digital devices can accomplish many feats, and every mechanism in root is encoded in binary. Since our controller is programmable, we can arbitrarily control its signals using code that can easily be modified by simply uploading a new program. The functions pin mode and digital write can be used to create simple digital signals like blinking an LED. Use pin mode in the setup function to configure pin 13 as an output. We're choosing 13 so that we can blink the LED that comes pre-soldered to the 13th pin of Arduino Uno's. In the loop function, we'll use digital write to set the output voltage to either 5 volts or 0 volts. Here we're using delay 1000 to make the controller pause 1000 milliseconds, or one whole second. To read a pin, use pin mode to configure a pin as an input, and use digital read to read that signal. When the code is executed, code within the parentheses are executed first, and then replaced with the resulting value. So if this code reads a 5 volt signal on pin 12, the digital write section would be replaced with a digital write 13 high, and the LED on the physical circuit board will turn on. If using a pull-up resistor like the circuit from our button section, a low would represent a button pressed and high would represent not pressed, since the button directly connects to ground when pressed. Analog Since digital means that the Arduino will only respond to 5 volt high and 0 volt low, you need an analog to digital converter to be able to read values in between. This will break down that analog signal and turn it into a digital number that the Arduino can deal with. Not all controllers have ADCs because they aren't always necessary, but the Arduino has six pins capable of reading analog signals. Use analog read in a similar fashion as digital read to read an analog pin. Those pins can be addressed using A0 through A6 as a pin number, the difference is that instead of getting a high or low with digital read, analog read returns a number between 0 and 1023, with 1023 representing 5 volts. The reason for this range is because the ADC has a 10-bit resolution, so the possible values a 10-bit binary number can represent is 2 to the 10th power, which equals 1024, and 0 is one of those values, so the maximum value is 2 to the 10th power minus 1, or 1023. That means that the smallest changes that can be read on an Arduino is 5 volt divided by 1023, or 4.89 millivolts per division. If the signal being read has meaningful data smaller than 4.89 millivolts, then an UNO would need an external ADC that has a higher resolution. PWM The Arduino has an analog write function, but it's not quite a direct method to output an analog signal. The UNO is digital so it still needs to be broken down into binary. So the way controllers often do that is with pulse width modulation, PWM. PWM turns that pin on and off very quickly to simulate an average analog signal. The pins with a wavy symbol on the UNO are capable of doing this. The PWM driver inside the UNO has an 8-bit resolution, so the maximum value for a full on signal would be 2 to the 8th power minus 1, or 255, while 0 volts would be 0. Using pin mode 9, 128 will drive an LED on pin 9 around half as bright as using digital write to light up the LED. What's actually happening is the pin would flash the LED so quickly that the human eye can't see the blinking, and the signal would be a square-shaped wave that's on 50% of the time and off the other half. Using analog write 9, 64 would make the signal on 25% of the time. Serial UART Many controllers have one or more methods for communicating text characters with other devices. Since 8-bit numbers can represent 256 unique values, this offers plenty of space to use a unique binary number to encode text. This is called ASCII code. An ASCII table shows what number in binary represents each character. For example, capital A is 65 and lowercase a is 97. The simplest type of serial to use for the UNO is Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, or UART. This has a TX pin for transmitting and an RX pin for receiving. On the UNO, this corresponds to pins 0 and 1. 
These pins are connected to a UART to USB converter chip and can be read on the host computer using the serial port in the Arduino IDE. Serial.begin will start up the serial port at a given signal speed, and you can use serial print to print to the host computer screen. When the serial monitor is open, the speed should be set to the same speed declared in the begin function, so the binary won't be misinterpreted. This sets the binary speed the host computer is expecting. The print function can be used with different types of data, and an optional format input can be used after the data option to specify how the data should be printed. Here's an example. This program simply starts the serial port at 9600 baud, prints some labels for the table, and then counts from 0 to 64. For each count, the program prints that number directly, and then prints formatted as a decimal number, then prints as a hexadecimal number, and then prints as a binary number. This shows how the same number can be interpreted as different formats. SPY There are other styles of serial communication that use binary encoding to facilitate transmitting ASCII text, each with their own pros and cons. UART requires two pins, TX and RX, for each pair of devices communicating, and they need to be configured in code to the same binary clock speed. This means that an UNO talking to five other devices would require five UART ports occupying ten individual pins on the UNO, and it only has one hardware-based UART port. Serial Peripheral Interface, or SPY, takes a different approach. The SPY protocol assumes that there is a master controller with slave devices like sensors or a microSD card that won't do anything on their own that the UNO controls. SPY uses a minimum of three pins, master in, slave out, MISO, master out, slave in, MOSI, and serial clock, SCK. On the UNO, pin 11 is MOSI, pin 12 is MISO, and SCK is pin 13. This means when a SPY device is being operated, the LED on pin 13 acts as an activity indicator. MISO is also comparable to RX pin in UART since that is the master input pin, and MOSI is comparable to the TX pin in UART, and instead of these devices needing to already know each other's speed, the master device tells the slave device the serial speed using the serial clock pin. When multiple slave devices are used, MISO, MOSI, and SCK pins for all devices are connected together, with one additional slave select pin for every additional slave device on the network. This way the UNO can specify which device should be listening to the network commands being sent out while all other devices ignore the data. This means SPY consumes three pins minimum on the host controller, and for every additional device, only one additional pin on the UNO is required. To compare this to UART that needed ten pins to talk to five devices, SPY could talk to seven devices using those ten pins. Oftentimes, SPY devices come with a library made by the selling companies, so a lot of the time, direct use of the SPY programming library is not necessary, instead using the sensor library functions themselves. Our microSD card example uses the SPY and the SD library, which are included in the Arduino IDE automatically. But other libraries would need to be manually included. More on that later. I2C. Inter-integrated circuit, or I2C, also sometimes referred to as two-wire interface, is the last type of serial that the UNO has dedicated hardware for. I2C uses a different approach at communicating with multiple devices using only two pins, as the name implies. Serial data on pin A4, and serial clock on pin A5. SPY uses additional selector pins so the UNO can tell which device should be listening to commands. I2C instead transmits a 7-bit binary number called an address. That acts as an identifying number for each slave device. Every device knows its own address and is usually set by the manufacturer and sometimes can be modified by changing physical pins on the circuit board. Since the address is only 7 bits, I2C can theoretically allow an UNO to control 2 to the 7 minus 1, or 127, unique devices using only 2 pins. Though many times as the number of sensors grow, so does the likelihood that one of the devices will have identical addresses, which means they would both respond to the Arduino at the same time and interrupt each other's data. Since the address is usually set in hardware, the only way around this address problem is to make sure that any devices that are meant to be used in the same system don't have the same addresses prior to buying them. The other downside to I2C is that it's slower than other serial protocols, though not all applications would be affected by the slower speed. I2C uses the wire library that's built into the Arduino IDE, but similar to SPY, a lot of the time the wire library isn't used directly, and instead a library made by the manufacturer specifically for that device is used. The barometer from our example payload uses I2C to talk to the UNO, 
So the two include statements are there to import the wire library and the library for the sensor made by Adafruit. All the low-level sensor interactions are being done by functions in the Adafruit library. Clocks Arduino has several clock and timing related functions that are very useful. The simplest one is delay, which makes the controller pause for the specified number of milliseconds. This however is inefficient since the controller is doing nothing during the pause, when it could be moving on to other meaningful tasks. Though not all applications are negatively affected by this. Another way to deal with timing is to use the millis function, which outputs the time since the startup in milliseconds. Another pair of functions, delay microseconds and micros, have the same functionality except on the microsecond scale instead of milliseconds. Just to show the difference in these functions' behavior, let's look at a code comparison. Here are two programs that blink three LEDs on pin 13, 12, and 11. On the left, we have a program that uses delay to create the blinking action, and on the right, we use some tricks with millis to make the three LEDs appear to blink at independent frequencies. On the left, we simply use pin mode to set pins 13, 12, and 11 as outputs, and then we sequentially turn each LED on, wait a little bit, and then turn it off, and then move on to the next LED. In the program on the right, we have pretty much the same setup, setting all of the LEDs to outputs. On line 5, we create three variables to store the time that each LED blinked last. On line 8, we store variables representing each LED's period. And on line 11, we have Boolean variables to represent the LED's state. Moving on to lines 23 to 27, if millis minus last blink is greater than or equal to period, then execute this block. So that means if the current millis timestamp minus the timestamp from the last blink is greater than the period, then we know to change the state. For this first situation, last blink 1 is initialized to 0, and period 1 is initialized to 250 milliseconds. So if the current timestamp minus 0 is greater than or equal to 250, then run this block. The first thing we do is we take the state and then invert that state, then digital write the LED that state, and then store the current time in that LED timestamp variable. And then the block from 29 to 33 and 35 to 39 do the exact same thing but for the other LEDs. Now let's think for a moment. Say 450 milliseconds have passed. This would mean LED 1 would blink on and the other two blocks would not be activated. Since the other two blocks period is greater than 450, the if check will evaluate to false and that whole block will be skipped. However, say a full second has passed. Then all of these if checks would pass and every block would be executed. And every time the block is executed, an LED state is flipped. Because the if-check is done very quickly and there's no point in time where the controller is just pausing, all of the LEDs will appear to blink independently from each other, where the use of the delay function to create the blinking effect doesn't allow blinking multiple LEDs at different rates. Here's another program that does the exact same thing as the millis example, but using integer arrays of 3 to reduce the amount of typing required. This simply illustrates that a task can be done in many different ways, and sometimes optimizing can reduce the amount of typing and amount of program size that's required. Programming Workflow Generally speaking, in C++ programming, a designer writes human-readable code, and when they're ready to test it, they use a tool called a compiler to check whether or not the code is written following the basic language rules called language syntax. After the syntax check, the compiler compiles or converts the code into binary which is ready for the target processor to run. C++ is a versatile programming language and can be used on desktop computers as well as microcontrollers, though microcontrollers have an additional step of uploading the binary code to the controller before it can be run. The Arduino Uno uses the Arduino Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, to check the program syntax, compile, and upload to any Arduino-compatible controller. Very commonly, the program is not perfect after the first time writing it, so testing, debugging, and re-uploading is usually part of the development process. In programming, people sometimes write a Hello World program or a Blink program for Arduino that simply shows the designer that their programming system is working. In order for the end program to be generated and run properly, several underlying tools need to work together, and at times there can be various problems stopping the host computer from compiling or uploading the code to the Arduino. A simple program blinking an LED can be used as a basic check to make sure the IDE is installed properly and is able to communicate with the target controller. The Arduino IDE has a lot of pre-made programs that can be used for testing by a designer, and one of them is a basic blink program great for doing the basic connection test. Controllers can be damaged, cables can be damaged, and sometimes a program itself can be so complex that it becomes unclear whether or not the basic connection to the Arduino is working properly. So a simple blink program is a great test to make sure that the host computer is still connected properly to the controller. 
A program is instructions for what a processor should do. Simpler controllers like the Uno can't do multiple tasks at once, but they make up for it by being able to do many operations very quickly. A designer must write code carefully, however, because while computers are machines capable of many sophisticated tasks, they execute code exactly as written. Let's see how to control a program flow. Data types. Recall that every bit of information in digital devices must be broken down and represented using binary. C++ generally, and the Arduino Uno specifically, have several types of data that it's able to represent using binary, since different types of numbers are useful for different contexts. For example, sometimes fractional values are needed, and other times only a number for counting is needed. Here are a list of some commonly used basic data types and what they're used for. All of these data types can be stored as a variable or used directly as a literal. A boolean or bool is the most basic unit of binary data, representing a logical true or false. A single logic 1 or 0 is called a bit. Generally, if any other data type has a binary 1 in it, the whole variable can be treated as a boolean true, where if all bits are 0, then it's treated as a false. A collection of 8 bits creates a byte, and when interpreted as a number, this can represent 0 to 255. An integer, or int, is a 16-bit number representing whole signed values. Signed means that these numbers can be positive or negative. The values that can be represented with a 16-bit signed integer are negative 2 to the 15 to 2 to the 15 minus 1. When declaring an integer value, unsigned can be specified to reserve all 16 bits for positive values, creating a range from 0 to 65,535. A long is a 32-bit integer number that's used for working with numbers larger than a normal integer can represent. Long also comes in signed and unsigned variants for representing positive and negative whole numbers, or for reserving all 32 bits for positive values. An unsigned long can represent numbers from 0 to this large number. Earlier examples used unsigned longs to store a timestamp representing how long an Arduino has been running in milliseconds. To compare, a millisecond timer would reach an unsigned integer's maximum value in around 66 seconds, where it would reach an unsigned long's maximum value in around 50 days. A float is a 32-bit number representing fractional values. The data formatting for this is more complex than integers, and is harder for 8-bit controllers like the Uno to operate with, so working with floats is often discouraged in the context of 8-bit controllers for their inefficiency. Floats can represent values as large as 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power, and as low as negative 3.4 times 10 to the 38th power. More generally, C++ also has a type called double, which is a floating point number that's double the bit size of a float, or 64 bits for higher precision. However, because of the limitation of the Uno and other Atmega controller processors, when doubles are created in the Arduino IDE, the system uses 32-bit floats instead of the full 64-bit representation. This means that doubles aren't normally usable on an Uno, where normal floats are just discouraged for their computational inefficiency. A char, or character, is an 8-bit number used to represent individual text characters. The 8 bits are stored as a signed number that represents characters using the ASCII encoding scheme. The numerical encoding for each character can be found on an ASCII chart. For example, 65 is capital A, 97 is lowercase a, and 126 is a tilde. Since the character encoding is based on a number, it's possible to do math on characters. For example, capital A plus 1 would be capital B, which is ASCII 66. When using chars directly in code, you use single quotes instead of double quotes. A string is a collection of characters to create words or phrases. Generally, there are two kinds of strings, C strings and string objects, denoted as string with a parentheses. A C string is directly a series of characters with a null character at the end of the series to show the computer that it's reached the end of the series. On the other hand, a string object is a complex data type that contains a C string along with extra functions that simplify certain string operations. The trade-off is that C strings are more memory efficient, but all operations on it must be done manually, where the string objects can be easier to program with but take up significantly more space in program memory. Generally speaking, string object use is discouraged with 8-bit controllers like the Uno because it's relatively low amount of program space and RAM, and strings are denoted with double quotes. Arrays are not data types themselves, but instead are a method of grouping the already stated data types. A designer can make a boolean array, which is a series of boolean values. A C string is directly an array of characters, with a null character to signal the end of the string. 
and a particular value in the array can be accessed by referencing its position in the array starting from zero. Here's just a simple program creating variables of all those types and then printing them to the screen. Notice on line 5 I use square brackets to denote that this is a character array as opposed to a single character. And notice that the character array and the string object both are strings but they're declared using different variable types. If statements. When a computer isn't just doing math, it's making decisions based on some condition. The basic form of this is a simple if check. If checks have an optional else if and else blocks for subsequent condition checks, and a default case that runs when all condition checks are false. Here's a screenshot of a program comparing a variable containing the number 360 to the number 180 written as a literal. In order, this program checks to see if 360 is equal to 180, not equal, less than, less than or equal to, greater than, and greater than or equal to. And on the right you can see the results of these checks. Another type of condition check called the switch case is also available in C++ and has a slightly different behavior, but generally it can be thought of as equivalent to a series of normal if checks. Loops. While simple computers like the UNO can be thought of as dumb for only being able to do one thing at a time, its ability to use a fast clock to loop operations very quickly can make up for those shortcomings. Take the UNO pinout, which has 14 digital-only pins that can be used for lighting up LEDs. A designer can use a trick to increase the number of LEDs usable with those pins from 14 to 49 by arranging the LED connections into a grid pattern with 7 rows and 7 columns. This would mean multiple LEDs can't be lit at the same time, however each LED can be scanned quickly enough to make them appear to light at the same time to the human eye. There are three basic methods for looping. The for loop, which is used when the designer knows how many times they want to loop. A while loop, which is used for looping an unknown number of times. And a do while loop, which is similar to the normal while loop, but always executes its contents at least once. A for loop has three parts to its mechanics. A starting count value, a condition that checks every time the loop starts, and an operation that runs after each time the loop finishes. For loop repeats continuously until the condition evaluates to false. While and do while loops only have the condition check, but do while has the body of the code before the condition check. Here's an example program with the serial output to show these loops behaving. First we use a for loop to count from 0 to 9. This for loop stops at 10 since 10 is not less than 10. Then on line 12 a count variable stores the value 9, and then uses a while loop to count down to 1. This doesn't include 0 because 0 is not greater than 0 in the condition check. Then lines 19 through 23 have the do while loop. The counter is set to value 5 and the condition checks to see whether or not the value is greater than 6. 5 is not greater than 6, but do while still executes at least once. Functions. The setup and loop blocks of code are called functions, and a designer can write their own functions that have their own contents to run in a program. Functions can have inputs and outputs, but like variables, they have to be declared before being able to use them. Normally in C++, variables and functions must be declared at the top of the program before use anywhere. But the Arduino IDE does some fancy work behind the scenes to make them accessible even if declared after the setup and loop functions. The setup and loop functions have no output, which is why they both have void as their output types. The parentheses by those function names are where function inputs can go, which setup and loop have none. This example program demonstrates two functions. One has two integer inputs, and outputs their sum using the return keyword. This means that the function runs, it executes its contents inside the brackets, and is replaced with whatever the returned value is. The other function is a void function that takes in a pin number and a delay duration, and turns on that pin number for the given delay duration. The setup function uses the adder three times to display its behavior, and then the loop function runs the blink and continuously increases the blink on time in 100 millisecond steps.